Docker is truly amazing and powerful, and that's why I figured it would be good to create a series of videos explaining the awesomeness of Docker and how it works. This is a video in a series about Docker, and if you haven't already, now would be the perfect moment to check out the other videos. Hi, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Johannes Frey, but you can simply call me Joe, and I've been working as a software engineer for more than 10 years. I'm based in Stuttgart, Germany, I'm self-employed and run a company that does programming, data science and DevOps, since at some point you also want to deploy your awesome machine learning models into production. The Docker documentation includes an awesome page with best practices and it's definitely worth checking it out. And I will link it down below in the description. The Docker documentation includes an awesome page with best practices and it's definitely worth checking it out. And I will link it down below in the description. But since the documentation covers lots of things and is maybe a bit too verbose, I picked the best practices most relevant for my daily work and I'll try to explain them giving real-world examples as well as adding some things that are not covered by the documentation. Be stateless. The Docker documentation calls this one create ephemeral containers. But since I'm German and I have no idea how to pronounce ephemeral correctly, I will go with be stateless. Big break time. So what that actually means is that you should make it easy to stop, destroy and replace containers without losing information. For example, when you have a container that stores some data in a database or some files like a web service, make sure to not store those things in the actual container, but use some sort of volume mount to store the data. Because then, when you update your web service and therefore replace the container with a new one, the data will not be lost but can be mounted to the new container and be used there. Use a .dockerignore file. To prevent certain files from being sent to the Docker build context, you can add them to a .dockerignore file. This file needs to be named .dockerignore and has to be present in the root directory of the Docker build context. The .dockerignore file can be used to reduce the size of the Docker build context that will be sent to the Docker daemon. It also can filter sensitive information that you don't want to actually copy into your Docker images. The syntax for this file is the same as for .gitignore or file globs of Unix shells, where there is one pattern on each line and everything matching at least one of those patterns will be excluded. Don't install unnecessary packages. This one's quite straightforward. Only install what is used. But there is more to that. Also check the base image that you built upon. Maybe this is also bigger and more bloated than it needs to be. For example, you could use Alpine Linux as your base image instead of Ubuntu. And as you can see on the Docker Hub page, Alpine Linux is only 5 megabytes in size and Ubuntu is almost 32 megabytes. And this can matter for both performance and security. Performance in terms of when you need to copy, build and or pull the image often and security in terms of more software, more potential vulnerabilities. So make sure to only include stuff that is really needed. I usually tend to start quite minimal with Alpine and then add the things that I need. This might be a little less convenient since you sometimes need to reiterate because you missed something that is needed and that you need to add to the Docker image and rebuild it. But I prefer it that way because it offers more control over what is actually bundled in the Docker image. Decouple applications. Since Docker images are so lightweight and easy to create, it is a good idea to create an own Docker image for every part of your application. So for example, if your application consists of several different microservices, it would be good to have a Docker image for every type of microservice instead of putting them all into one Docker image. This way, you are able to manage dependencies for each microservice more easily and are able to scale better horizontally. If one type of microservice gets more load than the others, you could just spawn more Docker containers of that type to fulfill the request. It is a good rule of thumb to only have one process running per Docker container, but this is no hard rule and there might be exceptions to that. Minimize the number of layers. It is a good idea to minimize the number of layers in your container for performance reasons and also to minimize error potential. For example, instead of writing apt get update and apt get install on one line, we could also split it in many different commands. 
and every one of those commands would generate overhead by adding an additional layer to the Docker image. And this specific use case would also introduce some sort of bug, since the app get update and app get install calls are now separated. The update part is no longer called when you add an additional package, which might cause that an older package gets installed since the new package lists are not fetched. Additionally, the command would not even run since we deleted the cache package list in the last command. So watch out for those cases and more important, try to combine commands when possible. One little bonus step, since we've seen that the cache package lists were deleted, it is a good idea to do that to reduce the image size, since when using the run command correctly for installing packages, package lists will be created by the apt get update command anyways. Structure your Docker file in a way that makes sense. The last and probably one of the most important tips is to structure your Docker file in a way that makes sense and benefits the most from the layered architecture of Docker images and its caching. As we already know, Docker caches all layers that have not been changed and recreates all layers following the one with the change. So it would be smart to structure your Docker file in a way where the parts that change most often come last and the parts that are quite static come first. So for example, when you want to use Docker to deploy a Python web service, usually the things that change most often are the source code files. So it would make sense to copy those last to the Docker image after, for example, installing Python via apt. This way, you ensure that you have the quickest build times possible for your Docker image. Please let me know down in the comments in which way I could improve my videos. And it would be super awesome if you would go completely crazy on the subscribe button as well as the like button, the bell icons to support my channel and to tell YouTube that you got some value out of my content so that it will recommend my video to other people as well. So, see you in the next one.